Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining uh, us for our webinar, Solving the Cybersecurity Workforce uh, and Skills Shortage. My name is Lauren Cloward, and I'm a policy advisor here at the Western Governors Association. Today, we will focus on critical needs and training and education uh, to strengthen the talent pipeline and build a workforce equipped for the cyber challenges of the 21st century. We have a great lineup of speakers with us, so thank you all for being here today. And each will begin with a presentation describing their work, and then we'll move into a moderated discussion. We encourage you to submit questions for our panelists using the Q&A function anytime during the webinar, and we'll do our best to answer them during the discussion. To, get, to kick us off, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Laura Bate. Laura is currently the Senior Director of the U.S. Cyberspace Solarium Commission and has extensive experience writing about information security and national security issues. Before her time with the commission, she worked as a policy analyst with the Cybersecurity Initiative at New America, where she was also involved in efforts to address diversity in the cybersecurity community. Laura, go ahead and take it away. Well, thanks so much. And thank you very much to WGA for putting together such an excellent group of speakers for this event. Um, I'm really excited to hear from everybody. Uh, to, to give a brief introduction, I, although I know your bios are far more extensive than this. Um, Rodney Peterson is the director of the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education at the National Institute for Standards and Technology in the U.S. Department of Commerce. He was the founder of, Educause, of, the, of the Educause Cybersecurity Initiative and the Higher Education Information Security Council. Dr. Mark Hagerot is the chancellor of the North Dakota University System of 11 campuses. He formerly served as the Distinguished Professor and Deputy Director of the U.S. Naval Academy Cybersecurity Center and holds a master's degree from Oxford University, where he studied as a Rhodes Scholar and a doctorate in the history of technology from the University of Maryland. Dr. Don Beyer is a Lockheed Martin Senior Fellow. She is their Cyber Fellows Action Team Chair, Co-Chair of the National Defense Industrial Association Cybersecurity Division, and a board member with the Women in Cybersecurity Board of Governors. Previously, she served as an Air Force Intelligence Officer for 24 years. Dominique Walsh is the Program Manager for the Closing the Skills Gap grant to create a cybersecurity apprenticeship program at the University of Wisconsin-Whitewater's Cybersecurity Center for Business. The Cybersecurity Center for Business provides cybersecurity education and training for businesses, local governments, and educational institutions throughout the Wisconsin and portions of Illinois. Um, so a fantastic group of talent and particularly perspectives on cybersecurity workforce development that really come from a wide range of lenses and angles of looking at the problem. I'm really excited to hear from everybody. As Lauren said, we'll kick off with presentations. Um, Rodney, would you like to take us away? Yeah, thank you so much, Laura. And thanks, Lauren and Amanda and the Western Governors Association for the invitation uh, to be with you today. Um, Good morning to those of you west of the East Coast where I am located and really pleased to share with you some background information about my organization, the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education, but more importantly, what's happening across the nation because NICE is not just a program within the federal government, but it's really a community. So the next slide introduces you to the mission of our organization, which reinforces some of the things that I wanna just make really clear that we are here to energize, promote, and coordinate a community working together. And that community, much as this panel today represents, includes the government, both at the federal and state level, as well as academia and industry. And we're working to advance an integrated ecosystem of cybersecurity education, training, and workforce development. There is a lot happening across the US, both at the local level, the state level, and at the federal or national level. Uh, our goal is to try to make sure that all those activities and initiatives, programs, projects are working in a similar direction. And that's a role that NICE plays both in terms of coordination as well as providing some guidance. The next slide begins to introduce a little more information about how we bring that community together on an annual basis. I'll have a few slides just kind of for promotional purposes, but in case you aren't aware, NICE does hold an annual conference that brings all those stakeholders together, not only for us to share our strategic plans and visions, but for the community to both share what they're doing as well as network with each other. And like I suspect many of you are aware, we've struggled during the pandemic of keeping our 
annual events going, have been doing them virtually. So our next in-person event will be next summer, June 6th through 8th in Atlanta, Georgia. But this event moves around nationally on an annual basis. So we've been in San Diego, we've been uh, in Kansas City, we've been um, in Texas and other areas where many of you live and work. So um, we'll be certainly moving around west of the US in future times as well. The next slide goes into a little more detail about the strategic goals and directions of NICE. Uh, we are authorized by Congress and expected every five years to update a strategic plan. And we just did this in October. So what you're about to hear and see is relatively new and recent. Kind of front and center is promoting career discovery. Because I think one of the things we'll talk about probably more today is despite all the education, training and workforce efforts, we have to introduce young people and working adults to cybersecurity as a career opportunity. So promoting the discovery of cybersecurity careers is kind of front and center. Moving to the left of that goal, we also work very closely with those who are providing education and training, ranging from K-12 education to community colleges and universities and training organizations. But quite frankly, employers do not find that the graduates being produced are really job ready with respect to cybersecurity skills. And so we need to make sure we transform that learning process to meet the needs of employers and make sure that we're effectively developing the competencies of those learners. Moving to the right of that career discovery kind of center focus is talent management and the need to modernize our approaches. You know, the federal government, quite frankly, is the first customer in line to try to modernize the way we approach re recruitment, hiring, uh, development development and retention, but we also see both in the private sector, the nonprofit sector needs to be more innovative to uh, help develop talent. I mean, one quick example I'll give you is I think one of the challenges we'll probably talk more about today is there aren't enough entry-level positions. We are certainly producing a lot of graduates from high school, community colleges, or even people who want to be reskilled into cybersecurity, but everybody's looking for that person with multiple credentials, three to five years experience, and that creates it's a missed opportunity to develop, as I like to say in the baseball world, that farm system of future talent that we can develop and grow to enter the big leagues. And then I'll say more in a moment about the NICE framework on the far left and then how we're doing research across all of our activities to make sure our work is based on evidence. So the next slide begins to introduce a few activities that kind of reinforce these goals. I mentioned the NICE framework. That is perhaps what we're best known for, the workforce framework for cybersecurity. It's a NIST special publication has the number 800-181 if you're a NIST guru. Uh, but as it I indicated the title is to focus on the cybersecurity workforce and particularly those roles across an enterprise, whether they be federal, state, or private sector that have some responsibility for managing the cybersecurity risk to an enterprise. One thing we did new in this version is we reintroduced the topic of competencies. I'll say more about that in a moment, but we also updated to remove things like specialty areas from previous versions, which increasingly are both reflected in competencies as well as work roles. And then if you know anything about workforce frameworks that talk about KSAs or knowledge, skills, abilities, we're kind of modernizing our approach to only talk about knowledge and skills and removing ability statements to either be restated as a knowledge or skill statement or a capability or qualification requirement. And finally, the NICE framework has lots of details in it, in turn, including 52 work role, thousands of tasks, knowledge and skill statements. And because we want to keep those updated more regularly, have them be more dynamic, we're moving them out of the official publication and onto our website where they can be maintained. The next slide talks a little bit more about that process I explained for competencies that we recently introduced. In fact, we've been working with the Western Governors University and other partners in trying to think about competency and skills frameworks that are more interoperable across our various audiences. So we do have a draft publication out for public comment. Comments are due May 3rd, in addition to kind of describing how you can think about cybersecurity competencies across various audiences or roles. Uh, we have a specific list of competencies that we welcome your feedback on as well. 
The next slide also introduces a little more about how we think about the workforce. And we invest and support a project called CyberSeek, cyberseek.org. This is just a screenshot of the map you will find with the number of open jobs across the country. Uh, this is a screenshot of the US, but as you see, every state is represented. You could drill down by state or metropolitan area, and it gives you a quick snapshot of the cybersecurity job market, if you will. The next slide demonstrates, though, how that is aligned to our NICE framework, because the NICE framework provides that common taxonomy and lexicon to describe cybersecurity work. So on the far left, you'll see our categories from the NICE framework and how those open jobs break down according to those categories. And because this is also a partnership with CompTIA and Burning Glass, they have data that shows the type of credentials through certifications that are available in those various marketplaces. And then the final thing in the next slide shows a career pathway portal as part of CyberSeek that we find really useful as a way to take a job seeker or a student to introduce them to cybersecurity careers, show them the career paths, how they can get in initially through a feeder role all the way up to an advanced level. And then at the bottom, you can get details about the salaries, the number of jobs, and then again, how it aligns to the NICE framework and how you can develop skills. So the next slide just continues to reinforce why career awareness is so important to us. In fact, we dedicate a year every or a week every year uh, to trying to promote career awareness across the ages and also trying to help those who are in positions of influence like school counselors, uh, college and career counselors, navigators, uh, parents, um, teachers, and others to be able to explain and describe cybersecurity careers. So we invite you to join us the third week in October annually for this event where a lot more information from across the community will be available. Next slide, please. So in addition to that awareness activity, as we'll talk more about later, we start at the very youngest age as possible, elementary, middle, high school, even preschool in some cases. And one way we do that is through promoting an annual K through 12 cybersecurity education conference to get this into the schools at a younger and younger age and equip our teachers and school administrators with the information they need to convey cybersecurity competencies and skills in that setting. Next slide. I just wanted to show you another partnership that we have with the National Security Agency for designating national centers of academic excellence in cybersecurity, which are community colleges and universities. And not surprisingly, just looking at this map here, a majority of them are kind of east of where the Western Governors Association line might be drawn. But you know, this quite frankly, largely reflects that CyberSeq map that I showed you earlier with certainly Texas and California having high workforce demand, but there's over 300 130 centers of academic excellence that we partner with as well. Next slide. So I just wanted to share with you just a quick overview. I'm, I'm looking forward to the discussion later and Laura with you and the panelists, you know, we can get into some of these topics a little more deeply, but wanted you to know that NICE is here as a resource to you. We partner, as I said, extensively with academia and industry. And this slide just shows how you can follow us online as well as being in touch with us. So thanks everyone and thanks Laura. Thank you very much, Rodney. That's fantastic. Um, and a lot of good information and resources. So, so appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Mark Hackerot, would you like to take us on our next presentation? We still have you, Mark? The unmute button. Someone has to have a patent, like the light, you're muted up here. You know, but anyways, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, no, as usual, uh, great. Uh, presentation by uh, Rodney, which which helps us understand the whole global uh, challenge, and I'll bring it down a little bit to a, a Western state and a large state, lower population uh, problem. And, and uh, if you go to the next slide, for those in the audience that you know aren't in those East West Coast things, I just got to make the point that that this is an epic time of our society and economy are digitizing. And so it isn't, as I've heard when I first got here, like, well, this cyber problem, you know, the digital thing, that's, that's you know, Washington, D.C., Silicon Valley. I think everyone's becoming aware that, that just about everything in our society is going to be affected. A simple way to think about it is there's been lots of micro revolutions of, you know, manual transmission to automatic, propeller to jet. Those were, you know, important things. But we are talking about the whole shift to autonomous robotic systems, dark manufacturing, because they don't need people there, 
all run by digital signals. Same with cyberspace, entire game rules emerging. But the showstopper is the security of these signals. Bring the next slide if we could. Um, and, and how do I mean that, that as a historian of technology, when you have these, these times of, um, of change like this, um, leaders have to adapt to these new technologies by creating them. Think about uh, creating new companies, but that's intellectual property, which you have to have security for intellectual property. Otherwise, your patents become worthless. Um, and then civilized the machine um, is an expression of the Industrial Revolution, one of my favorite books um, about what they had to do when we began to industrialize. Well, we just had uh, a seminar in North Dakota yesterday on Apple's App Store, uh, digital privacy for the students. Well, the only way you can have privacy is, is agreements, but also the security of the signals, which leads to the whole control of the digital revolution in a, in a way that enhances you know, the quality of our communities, the quality of our, of our ability to innovate, and that comes down to the cybersecurity uh, challenge. So that, that's for the audience members thinking, well, this is kind of a, a minor issue. It is the foundational issue to do these other two things to protect our privacy of our children, our families, our intellectual property. And we've all heard that. President Biden has talked about the, the sheer theft of, of our intellectual property could basically uh, take what I've heard is, is a significant percentage off of GDP growth. Um, but the education part, though, um, is the next challenge within that, uh, because you've got to have these people understand the technology. Um, and then also you have to have through education, the regeneration of that workforce, right? It's not like we're going to just solve this problem like right now, like in, in the Second World War, people understood that we had to train X number of artillerymen. And once that was over, they retired all the artillerymen with these small numbers. You know, the army went down to one tenth its size. This is a new condition of life. We, this is never going to go away, right? It's not like ramp up the artillerymen and then get rid of them when the war is over. We are in this for as long as the digital world exists. Um, but there's some complicating factors, especially for Western states. Next slide. Um, as you can see on and Rodney's map, that was a great one, is that a, a lot of these places, you know, like I was stationed in Annapolis and worked at the Pentagon and just the Washington DC area is just, well, just culturally and historically, it's fascinating but it's just this machine, much like Silicon Valley, 5 million people and NSA and universities with top-notch programs. You know, professors could teach it at Maryland and then come to Annapolis and vice versa. Well, when you get out in these Western states, it is very difficult uh, because of low density to achieve the scale, all right, to be able to, to have some people teaching. I'll teach, you know, Python and I'll teach, you know, human factors and cybersecurity. Well, how do you do that? And then We've also found that because our salaries are lower, because we have lower scale, um, we then are susceptible to poaching. Um, and I uh, believe it or not, I was in a conference um, where a, a big university with lots of money referred to the Mountain West, rural upper Midwest as the candy jar of where we go to pick people during like the commodity cycle. I kid you not. I mean, said it in a Nature Magazine forum um, he said, that's where we get our talent. We don't have time. Like Rodney was saying, we don't have time to grow a lot of these people. But we know where we can go, you know, double their pay. And so that does not help our state or this part of the country. Um, so what have we done? Next slide. Um, so you can see our state. We have, uh, you know, 11 universities. Some of them are bigger. The two on the east, this is just the accent of our state was settled from the east to the west. So our two research universities are literally within 10 miles of, of, uh, of Minnesota. Whereas you get out into the Western part, uh, the Chronicle of Higher Ed has called them one of the four education deserts of America. You've got to, you've got to go 100 miles round trip uh, to get a welding class. Now, thankfully, with the internet, online education, we're beginning to solve this by through integration and then our five tribal colleges. I don't know if people know, but that area that, um, that Rodney showed, that kind of light area in the upper Midwest, but you know, half of all the nation's tribal colleges and tribes are in that area. So. Um, you know, if you want to help minority areas, let alone rural families to engage in this modernizing economy, we have to help solve this problem. And this is some of the stuff we're doing is partnering, sharing the credits. And the last thing we did just a few months ago was we established what we call the Dakota Digital Academy um, that has both a review, Dakota Digital Review, to talk about, you know, humanizing the machine, policy, law, ethics, privacy, um, and then the technical part. And it's a one portal virtual 
where all 11 campuses in the state system and on the five tribals are about to sign an MOU can all find what they need. They can share instructors and we can then hopefully get that scale and also be able to retain people because we might be able to then pay higher salaries for key instructors um, that otherwise could be poached away. Um, but you know, where do we get the pipeline for the students to come to our schools? Next slide. Um, I get our, give our governor credit for this. Uh, he's a former Microsoft uh, executive, founded his own company, sold it uh, you know, for a billion, which seems maybe small now, but that was 20 years ago. Uh, he actually was Satya Adala's boss, so he helped mentor the current CEO of Microsoft. Um, and he early on saw we had to get young people to, to get excited about this, you know, um, being the policeman of the internet, right? You know, I mean, I would challenge my students, either you're going to control these machines or someone else is going to control them from someplace else. So, so get excited about this. And, um, and so we, we have this all the way from kindergarten up to high school seniors and then K-20 up to the doctorates. We've got the first doctorate in America um, on cyber education degree in the, in the doctoral level. So if you want to be a cyber educator, uh, we're offering that at North Dakota State. Um, and so what else have we been able to do, again, with the help of, of people like Rodney and NSA, next slide, is we did in one year get two CAE uh, certifications, one of the research university and then one at Bismarck State, which is our polytechnic, which I can see out my window in the state capitol. Uh, but a point I want to make here is that we are a commodity driven state, oil and agriculture, and they both went in a synchronous dive a couple of years ago. We were in a huge budget crisis. We cut hundreds and hundreds of faculty, um, and yet we were still able to build these two cyber centers because uh, a corporation came in and partnered with us and literally gave us millions of dollars. Um, and so that's another, I think, uh, key element here is partnering with uh, these big companies that want to diversify their workforce and maybe someone else, because I, I think uh, it's Don Beyer from Lockheed. You know, there is an accelerating uh, inflation in these salaries, maybe in some areas, but you can probably get some good cyber talent out in these other areas where people can still live back on the farm and uh, commute from a distance, right? You know, I mean, um, we're, we're, we've got some of the best uh, broadband in America here. Um, I just got broadband out of my little farm uh, last year. So um, I think that's all I've got at this point. Last slide is just if you have other questions for anyone in your audience, want to reach out, I'm always glad uh, to uh, tell you what we're doing up here. Thanks so much, Mark. As, as a proud Westerner and a transplant to the East Coast, it is definitely remarkable to see that such things can be done. I wish we had mm -hmm. that kind of virtual work and virtual learning when I was, when I was looking into it. Um, but fantastic. And thank you very much for, for your contribution there. Um, and speaking of Dr. Don Beyer, uh, would you like to talk to us a bit about what Lockheed Martin is doing? Yeah, thank you. Um, and thanks for uh, letting me participate on this um, great discussion. Um, I do want to, we are covering a lot of different areas of a pipeline, but uh, my responsibilities or part of my responsibilities as a senior fellow is to attract, develop, and retain cyber top talent. Um, and so this is what I'm gonna talk to. I wanna start off with, um, I'm gonna work from the left to the right and uh, talk to why a cybersecurity workforce is so important. Um, I'm gonna start off with uh, just going over a little bit about some of the, uh, the cyber threat from state actors. So this isn't, you know, the, some of the citizens that make up the state, but this is the, uh, the state it, itself. So um, for example, uh, we have uh, Russia's cyber capabilities are among the most advanced in the world. And also given their prolific use of cyber attacks on a regular basis, um, their cyber capabilities pose a significant threat to the United States. Um, and uh, looking at what we develop um, at Lockheed Martin and a lot of the defense contractors, um, these are really big threats um, for us. And then we also have Iran, um, which also has a sophisticated cyber capabilities. And uh, they're also believed to be actively exploring uh, military uses of their cyber capabilities to uh, disrupt our missile defense systems, our lo logistics operations, and also our C2 links. And then we have um, North Korea um, who can also initiate cyber attacks. For example, uh, look what happened in the Sony attack. And then we have China. Um, so China's military who 
created um, a dedicated cyber offensive and defensive teams whose mission is um, includes coordinating and executing electronic warfare, um, space and counter space and cyber warfare activities. Um, and they also look at our United States um, cyber apps, assets as being very vulnerable. And so for um, all of these reasons, um, and again, the work that we do, uh, a lot of developing of platforms, um, we really expect that our cyber workforce not only stays on top of what they're supposed to be doing, um, you know, whether it's penetration testing, cyber architecture, whether it's system security engineering, um, but they also need to stay on top of what the cyber threat information is. And that's the TTPs, like, um, and also the threat intelligence reports, security alerts, uh, and then um, defensive measures like mitigation strategies, uh, threat detection techniques, and um, information sharing is really important across the corporation. So if one program um, finds a, vul a vulnerability um, and knows how to mitigate that vulnerability, uh, and if they can, because there's also a lot of clearances and uh, security protocols that play a big part in this decision, but if they can to share that information uh, with the other programs. Um, the TTPs, I know I talked about the acronym, I'm really big in acronyms, but it's tactics, techniques, and procedures. So according to the national um, cyber strategy, our peer competitors are implementing a workforce development programs that have the potential to harm long-term US cybersecurity competitiveness. And they acknowledge that a highly skilled cybersecurity workforce is a strategic national security advantage. So this strategy calls out the necessity to develop a superior workforce, um, build and sustain the talent pipeline, and then also highlight and award this workforce. So we also have the Department of Defense their strategic approach also includes cultivating talent and their strategy talks to establishing a cyber talent program that provides our most skilled personnel with focused resources and opportunities to develop key skills over the course of their careers. And then also to identify the most capable and then empower those personnel to solve the toughest challenges. Um, you know, I read a lot on this, um, on the workforce pipeline and development um, of the workforce and retention and attracting um, specifically on uh, high potential employees. And again, um, those that are considered um, maybe the top 1% um, of the workforce. So I read this article. Um, it was, uh, was by uh, Sophia Lee. It was on seven amazing ways mentoring can benefit your organization and um, a lot of the metrics that I'm going to use aren't me doing all this research and the metrics I'm leveraging a lot that was already done. But this one was um, high potential employees work 21% harder than their peers, and they bring 91% more value to the organization. And that's huge. And that's why we have um, a fellows program within uh, Lockheed Martin. So the purpose of this fellows program um, is to recognize and celebrate superb technical achievements and leadership. And then it's also to inspire um, the overall technical population uh, to the highest levels of excellence in the technical career path. And then also leverage the corporation's world-class engineers, scientists, and technologists. So just to give you an example of um, the type of percentage um, that are in this program. So we have around 100,000 people at Lockheed Martin. Um, only uh, 323 are fellows right now, changes depending on um, uh, retirements and uh, people leaving. Um, and then we have the senior fellows and there's only um, 74 of us senior fellows out of 100,000 people. And it's expected that we do a lot of mentoring um, and knowledge sharing across the corporation and that we develop a pipeline that starts at um, our levels three, so a lower levels uh, with our recognized technical talent. That's uh, one category. And then the next is associate fellows and then fellows, um, senior fellows. Um, the fellows are held to the highest standards and are expected to continuously demonstrate exceptional job performance and then also provide significant business impact uh, through leadership 
um, and like I said earlier, mentoring. And um, the people that are in this program are simply amazing. And um, if it wasn't for the program and the mentoring programs that we put in place, um, I'm, I'm not sure how big the program uh, itself would be um, or um, the type of talent that we have uh, within the program as well. So um, like I said, it's uh, they say that employees, uh, this is another metric, so I'll read it. It's not mine. <laughs> employees who were mentored were five times more likely to be promoted and 44% less likely to leave the company over a five-year period. And turnover among participants in a mentoring program is 2% versus 27.5% among other employees. Um, one more I found also what was really interesting in, in some of the um, research I did on this work, um, mentoring programs boost the representation of Black, Hispanic, and Asian Americans anywhere from 9% to 24%. Um, that's a huge difference, the 9 to 24. So uh, thank you for an opportunity for letting me share this program and the importance of um, mentoring and uh, shaping our top talent programs. Thank you so much, Don. And I think that's a great sort of picture of, you know, when, when Rodney was talking, he talked about sort of building a farm team. I think that that shows how, how that can be done. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to dig into that idea of sort of development, mentorship, and, and how you take um, adults who are entering the workforce and, and really figure out how to connect them with the skills they need. Uh, Dominique, do you want to talk a bit about what you're doing uh, with, with your program? Yes, thanks a lot. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. And um, we're gonna, I'm gonna show you the exact same map that Rodney showed earlier. Um, this is the CyberSeq map. And um, uh, before we get started, I just wanna tell you a little bit about our program. So um, I work at the University of Wisconsin Whitewater's Cybersecurity Center for Business. Um, UW Whitewater is in Southeast Wisconsin in Whitewater. Uh, we enroll about 14,000 students and the, um, the Cybersecurity Center is part of the business college that has about 4,200 students. And I'm showing you this map because uh, when I pulled this off of the website uh, last Friday, about a week ago, there were over 5,200 job openings in cyber in Wisconsin alone, just in, in our state. And But when I dug into it and I looked at some of the top job titles, they're like cybersecurity engineer, architect, analyst, um, auditor, all kinds of things. And uh, they're, they're kind of, uh, you know, higher level jobs than um, Rodney's farm team, right? Uh, we, we are really focused on those entry level jobs and, people, and getting people into those entry level jobs so that later on they can become top talent for people like Dawn. Um, if you could move the slide, please. Thanks. So we took the framework that Rodney was talking about earlier, and, and we've started to kind of think about, okay, but there are plenty of people who might be really good um, cybersecurity talent who just aren't even part of the feeder rules pipeline, right? They, they have no background in IT, they have no background in cyber. And, um, and as people are moving up from the feeder rules into entry level and mid level roles, they, they aren't um, they aren't being replaced at a fast enough level, which is why we have all of these empty jobs. Um, so there's that workforce gap in the lower ranks and we're quickly reaching the time in which the population that normally fills these feeder roles is shrinking. So we need to bring in people um, who we, may not, we might not ordinarily think of as being involved or, or being interested in these jobs. So people who are underemployed, people who are undereducated, um, people who are unemployed maybe. Um, and we, we need to bring in people with basically no background into the, in the field and, and get them into feeder roles. So um, my colleague, Dr. Roger Yin, he talks about feeders to the feeder roles and he's the one who created this pyramid for me. Um, and so that's kind of like the, the focus on um, our program, which is a cybersecurity apprenticeship training program. Um, and so that, if you can move on to the next slide, please. Thanks. Um, so we, uh, the Cybersecurity Center got a um, Closing the Skills Gap grant um, to create a cybersecurity apprenticeship program. 
Now there are apprenticeship programs in cyber out there. They're generally registered apprenticeship programs and those apprenticeships haven't been working particularly well. Um, in our state, there's a registered apprenticeship program um, and they've actually only had like one or two people complete it in the last three years. Um, and many of those registered apprenticeships require a lot of experience. So maybe three to five years experience in the field. They require security clearance. They require degrees. And someone who has a degree in cybersecurity isn't going to want to then move into an apprenticeship. So ours is actually, it's called an IRAP, an industry recognized apprenticeship program. Um, and it's created basically so that it can be a little bit more maneuverable. And But we're, we're starting with people who have pretty much no background. So um, we provide a 16 week training that is again, um, some of our fabulous um, colleagues, the University of Wisconsin Whitewater have created a curriculum um, to help people prepare for the CompTIA A plus exam. Now I know that the A plus exam is a pretty basic certification in the IT world. But remember, we're kind of assuming that our folks aren't going to have any experience um, and we're trying to get them to do this in like a, a four month time span. So like we're really starting at the very, very basic level. And but we're also including in that training content for that A plus exam, but we're also including a component of stress management because um, cybersecurity professionals regularly cite that they are stressed or very stressed at their jobs, and a lot of them feel like they're not really achieving a work-life balance. So by kind of getting in really early and saying, okay, here's how to do stress management, um, then they're less likely to make errors later on in, in their careers, hopefully. Um, we're also doing 600 hours of paid on-the-job training. Uh, again, that's just to, to get them in there. Um, that training is basically to create a cybersecurity plan um, based on that NIST framework, right? That So we want them in there, like looking at businesses and helping businesses to create um, a, a plan. A lot of small businesses don't have anyone looking at cyber right now. So our, our apprentices can kind of help with that. Um, we also are providing mentorship, um, kind of working on um, exposing them to a career development roadmap. Um, and we're also focused a, a lot on diversifying the workforce. Um, we're for, our, our grant is focused a lot on military veterans, military spouses, people of color. Um, we have lots of partnerships with local organizations like the Hispanic Collaborative in, in Milwaukee and Amer African American Chambers of Commerce. Um, it does come with some difficulties, but you know, what doesn't? Um, and our goal is to basically start from scratch with people who have no background in cybersecurity, and maybe they're even really intimidated, right, by the idea of working in IT or working in cybersecurity. Um, maybe get them into just a help desk position, a very basic help desk position where they can be cybersecurity evangelists and really focus on getting good cyber hygiene in those small to medium sized businesses where frequently no one's worried about cyber. Um, we want to help incumbent workers get trained to do this for their current employers, um, upskill a little bit. Um, and have them earn a living wage while they, they can then decide what career path they want to take, right? Do they wanna continue maybe from our program into a registered apprenticeship program? Maybe they wanna um, continue stacking certifications um, to continue their own their career. Or maybe they want to go to a two or four year program. Maybe they're gonna enroll in UW-Whitewater. That's the dream, right? Um, okay, if you could go to the next slide. Um, so that's where we're at. We're a relatively new program. We have a couple of cohorts going through our program right now. In another year or two, we're going to be really excited to share our data and hopefully see about the success of the program. Um, it's a really exciting time for us. It's an exciting program. Um, and I think it can really be an advantage to those who take advantage of it. And I think it can be, it can really help us to develop, as Rodney called it, those farm teams. I really think that that's, that's going to help so that we have more people um, who can then become that really, um, that high talent that Dawn is looking for. So thanks a lot. Thanks so much, Dominique. What a unique program. Um, I like the stress management. That is one I have never heard before, but I can see how it would be critical. Um, between that and all of the other issues that have come up throughout the course of these presentations, I think we, we all understand that um, the issues and the challenges facing us in cybersecurity workforce development are broad and they're interconnected and um, they, they impact one another. So I know that as we start to prioritize uh, 
where you even start in all of that, it's hard to find one particular spot. But my first question for the panelists to, to whoever wants to answer it is, what do you see as the greatest challenge facing the cyber workforce? Recognizing they're all interconnected, recognizing that there's no, no right or wrong answer to that question. Where would you want to start? Mark, do you want to start us off? Thank you. Yeah, I, um, you know, we have the immediate crisis. I mean, literally, as, as the speakers, especially Don, I mean, we are in, it could be a cyber cold war right now. So there's the crisis of getting talent to the ramparts right now, you know, um, which could be bringing back retired um, coders and others saying, hey, we need you to spin this up. But the long-term thing, so I'll talk long-term, I think really has to be in the K-12 system, getting more young people to engage the, the math sciences and the cyber sciences early um, because, you know, much of this space, you've got to get clearances and all the rest. And, and so having, you know, your indigenous workforce here that can, can, you know, have the highest level qualifications and you don't have to keep sorting through, um, you know, trying to um, augment with um, overseas workforce, which has been wonderful, but building our own early on, they've got to start performing better. So I'd say that the two challenges are short-term crisis, man the ramparts, and then building this base through um, K-12. Yeah, I think that's a really important distinction to make. Rodney? Yeah, I think from a NICE and NIST perspective, standardization comes to mind first and foremost. That's why our framework is so important to create that common language so that whether we're speaking across industry to academia or the learner, the student in between, that we're creating some common approaches and common methods. And that doesn't mean that everybody has to do it exactly the same way because we need creativity and innovation. That's why the apprenticeship programs, which are kind of new to the scene, if you will, for these kind of roles are very important and a, and a very important approach to take. But I think we need to make sure that we have, and I like to use the word interoperable approaches or as our mission set, integrated ecosystems. So that if we're doing something at the K-12 school, a student can easily transition to a community college or university or into the workforce. So I think that combination of having a standard like the NICE framework, but also uh, educational standards in K-12 and higher education that are speaking the same language. And then industry largely as a consumer of the workforce being produced both through education, apprenticeships, training, and other mechanisms uh, is able to speak a similar language so that we don't have a disconnect. So I would say that, you know, the ongoing effort to become increasingly standardized is, is one of the challenges that we're trying to tackle. Yeah, absolutely. Anybody else want to take a whack at that one, Don Dominique? Good. Yeah, I don't want to have to pick my greatest challenge in that one either. There's, <laughs> there's a lot to choose from. Um, but, but thank you. Thank you both for diving in on that one. Um, you know, I want to take actually, I really like that framing that you set up there, Mark, um, for looking at the sort of man the rhyme parts challenge and then the setting up the longer educational system. Um, looking at that second part of that, the, the sort of long educational tail or whatever precedes. Um, my own opinion is that cybersecurity education is really important at all ages and all stages of education and careers. Uh, but the form of that education and the goals of that education change over time, or rather change at the point that people are in their education. Um, what do you all think that that cybersecurity education can or should look like at different ages? Uh, if, if we're looking at K-12 education or even pre-K-12, uh, post-secondary, throughout careers, how, how do the goals of those educational systems change? How should they change? Or as an employer, what do you need people have to have encountered as, as they've gone through their careers? Laura, I can just give you a simple paradigm that the U.S. Department of Education uses to talk about career discovery that I mentioned is one of our strategic goals, and that is thinking of elementary age children is where career awareness begins. Uh, I have a daughter who's a third grade teacher, was previously a first grade teacher, and I know, especially from having heard her teach in my home this last year, that she talks with young third graders about careers regularly. And so that's not too early to start exposing them to the types of careers they may explore. Middle school is where career exploration occurs. And so I think you see more formal programs, including career fairs and having guest speakers and trying to tie careers to curriculum. 
Uh, and then high school is um, career preparation. And that could either be for entering in the workforce directly, a youth apprenticeship or a formal apprenticeship program, going to a community college or university. So for any of us that have been to high school, you know that's where you start setting the foundation for what you're gonna do next, either academically or career-wise. So that's just one way we think about the distinction between elementary, middle, and high school specifically. Absolutely. Yeah, and I would just like to add to that. And then there are people who maybe in that K through 12 framework don't express an interest in cyber or STEM or whatever. And I feel like that's where our program can really come in and like take someone who maybe has, maybe they're a high school dropout, maybe they just have a high school degree or they have a degree in a different field. And we can kind of start training them again as if they have no background. So there has to be different um, ways in, right? It can't just be like we're directly going from high school into an apprenticeship and now we're we're hired by that company. There have to be different ways into the career once we reach a, once once we're past the K through 12 pipeline. Yeah, I think that absolutely makes sense. We often refer to it as a pipeline, which makes you think it's just one straight line going through, but it's not and it can't be. Uh, I, I think that makes sense. Don, I saw you pop off mute. Did you want to Jump in there. Oh yeah, yeah. There's, there's also, um, and it, it probably doesn't matter what age group. Um, I think that we need to do more teaching into critical thinking. Um, I think that that can be done at any age, um, and and it, it just gets mature over time. Um, so critical thinking is really important. Um, also, um, teaching about how to taking risks. Uh, so there's um, a lot of people that I mentor and uh, people that I've reached out. There are people I've reached out for, for the top talent programs that didn't want to participate in the program. And so I'm telling them I wouldn't have called you if I didn't think that you could be in the program. Um, but some of them just didn't want to take the risk. Um, what I found, though, was after the fourth phone call of hearing like no, um, that uh, if I just tell people that I have their back, like I'm not gonna let you fail, I have your back, um, then all of a sudden the no's started becoming yeses. And really uh, for a lot of those yeses, I, I did nothing. <laughs> so, I mean, they're, they're performing that just at an awesome um, level. So it's, it's just, I guess, people hearing that. But um, the big thing, critical thinking, taking more risks, and I don't like hearing about lowering standards um, uh, because you know what? Our adversaries aren't lowering their standards. So um, if, uh, if there's any, um, I think that if pe before people lower standards, they think to need to do some critical thinking into the root cause of why there's an issue. And what can we do, whether it's a group of people or you know, a geographical location or a um, you know, certain um, school, um, what can we do to help them bring them to that next level instead of just lowering the standards? Um, I also saw something about lowering the standards on behavior and meeting deadlines. And that, that's really scary because when you lower requirements for behavior and you look at um, deadlines as not being something that isn't really necessary, you're really, what you're doing is creating, you're, you're, you're setting those people up for failure. You, you're not helping them, you're setting them up for failure. So when they go into the workforce and things like that happen, um, they're gonna fail. So again, those three things are, are really important to me in, gosh, in anything that we've talked about so far, as far as the educational pipeline and some of the challenges in the workforce. Yeah, all great points. And actually I wanna um, pull in some questions that we've had from the audience here, several of which I think are related to this sort of educational pipeline. Um, the, the big umbrella question here is, what are your recommendations for people who are starting out? Um, but to give a couple of specific cases, uh, we've got one, one questioner who's asking, as a teenager graduating in 2021, where do you start? Uh, another asks, I have a year left before completing a bachelor's in IS, uh, information security, I'm imagining, um, and a minor in cybersecurity, and is wondering the best ways I can prepare on my own as I close in on graduation. Are there any resources, reading, video that you would recommend? Um, third, quite conveniently, as we move our way through the educational pipeline, asks, what sort of opportunities should I be look, looking for in regards to apprenticeships or practical training? Um, 
I feel it is difficult to know where, when I'm prepared to enter the industry, even at an entry level position, as there seems to be so many moving elements when it comes to technology. So my, my question for all the panelists is whether you're talking about people who are just leaving high school or people who are getting ready to leave college or people who are trying to get their first toehold in the workforce there. Um, are there any strategies, tips, tips that you give young folks as they come to you? And I know as, as our panelists think about that, since I got the question first and have a second to think about it, um, I can put at least a few of my suggestions out there. Um, there's quite a lot of good free online courseware out there. Uh, some, some of it's better than others, um, but Coursera, Udemy, there, there are some things like that that really do provide good resources. Actually, if I remember correctly, at the outset of the pandemic, when everything shut down, Rodney and his team put together um, a page full of free or low cost resources for people to learn about information security. So there's a lot of sort of teach yourself, figure out what the basics of this are that, that are out there available just online. Uh, anybody else want to jump in with their favorite pieces of advice for, for folks starting into the field? Um, for me, it's be, you need to build a network. Um, you should start building that network as early as possible um, before you're in your junior, senior year. You can do things like that by joining um, industry associations. Um, that's a great way to start building a network and uh, finding mentors as well and people that can champion you. Uh, to break into that again is, is industry associations. And I know that a lot of campuses have uh, different group uh, resource groups. Um, they have, uh, gosh, even my daughter's um, sorority, um, they have um, different connections like the alumni and stuff that get together and try and help the people within um, the sororities. Uh, but, uh, you know, they say that the, the what increases your chances of getting a job is, um, is you know, through your network, using your network. So um, that would be uh, one way that you could do um, early. Um, people, I've even seen people starting to do that in their junior, senior year of high school. Laura, I'm not sure if everybody's seeing the links I'm providing. I did provide the link you mentioned to the low cost training content, which was something we did after the pandemic. And quite frankly, it wasn't just for young people. Uh, there were a lot of working professionals that were losing their jobs and looking for a new career or had time in their hands, quite frankly, and wanted to brush up on their skills. So that was kind of what stimulated that project. Uh, but we also did a recent webinar where we brought in a couple industry speakers to provide advice to students. In fact, we did something a little Little creative. I normally moderate the, the webinars, but I brought in a uh, high school student and a community college student to be the host. And from their perspectives, they were trying to get, like Dawn mentioned, from a mentor's perspective, uh, what it takes to enter into cybersecurity, ranging from preparation to how do I choose a career. And, and just one quick anecdote from that webinar that I love is one of the speakers talked about, you know, how to take something like being a, a Starbucks barista. And how do you translate that to an employer to make it relevant? Because you know some of the critical thinking skills, problem solving skills, customer service skills that people often expect in cybersecurity, you can learn from other occupations or summer jobs or part-time jobs as well. So anyway, those are there in the link. And again, our, our Career Awareness Week website has many resources that students can pursue or any learner can pursue independently to learn more about cybersecurity careers. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think in a lot of ways, any, anybody else want to jump in on that one? <laughs> in a lot of ways, I think all of that ties back into the point that you were making earlier, uh, Dominique, about having sort of a lot of different pathways into the workforce. You know, we build the workforce overall by creating all of these different opportunities for people to be self-taught or to, you know, get their jump on things. It, it, it gives us one more pathway, one more point of entry for people to start entering the field. So I think it's really, really valuable to the overall goal as well. Um, and if I could just say that the questioners are, are on to a real issue. Typical academics don't think about that, right? I taught my course, I did this. So, you know, over to you now, figure out your next life. So in this Dakota Digital Academy portal we're building, we're building these stackable credentials that you can get. Um, Bismarck State, which is becoming our polytechnic, uh, calls it mechatronics. It ties in digital machines, manufacturing, cybersecurity, you know, several skill sets. So you can have some certificates in digital manufacturing, 
in some basic coding, um, SCADA systems, and then cyber. But then also we want to build a portal there where industry can post internships, apprenticeships, job openings, you know, in a, in a geographical location that they're comfortable with. Because, you know, a lot of rural young people, especially tribal people who feel very close to their land. I mean, this, this idea of being a disembodied global population that goes anywhere, you, Laura, you know, being from the West, they are tied to the mountains of the upper Midwest and want to work from here. You know, so the idea of, of this talent just flowing to Boston, New York, Silicon Valley and DC doesn't help so much. So finding where they can work locally. And, you know, if they're, if they're the next Albert Einstein or Madame Curie, then, then go to NSA and help win the hyper battles with the Chinese, you know, I, I totally get that too. But many of them want to be able to work in, in their local communities in these career fields. Yeah, absolutely. I, oh, this is the longest I've been away from the mountains literally in my entire life because I haven't been able to go home. So you're, you're really speaking to me there. Um, I want to pull on a, a thread of, of something that you mentioned there, Mark. Um, one of our question askers is, is interested in this issue of stackable credentials. Uh, the, the question is, are there efforts underway or existing models achieving success in integrating stackable credentials into conventional academic curriculum? This could really start in middle or high school, seems like a big opportunity and a natural approach that is not being done very much or very well. Now, you, you've given us a perfect example of sort of the integration of stackable credentials, but can you can you pull out a part a, a little bit more just first what that term means and, and what it looks like in practice? Yeah, well, we are, you know, there's other, and probably Rodney knows who's doing it best in the country, but we know we were behind on this because we told students here, you know, start this four-year degree, and, and, this, and young men especially, you know, um, we have a higher dropout rate, um, definitely Native Americans higher dropout rate. And so we begin to realize, hold on, we need to show them success early. And so for example, this mechatronics program that uh, we hired away uh, a president out of Illinois who built this at his university, also won a CAE there and he's now building at our polytechnic, but, but literally in one semester, they would not only have, oh, I earned 15 credits toward a bachelor's degree, but I now have a, a credential that is recognized in this field. And I actually have accomplished something right now. And then you stack these up and it could lead to the, you know, some of the cyber credentialing that we all know about. Um, and, uh, and then also something maybe in industry as well. Um, but, uh, but the idea is you can stack these together and come in and out and you're feeling like you're accomplishing and getting credentials. And this also helps adult learners coming back. Let's say you got a business degree. You're great, you know, you're that, that Starbucks person, you're running a Starbucks place, but like, I wanna take these business skills into now the cybersecurity part of, of you know, um, Starbucks industry maybe. Oh, I need to go back, I get this credential, I get this credential, and they can begin to use them in their resume and maybe even part-time work, you know? Um, so that's kind of that, but I, I defer to Rodney if he's got some examples of, of people who are doing it best. You know, we are rapidly building it, but we are probably behind some of the other places. Yeah, just quickly, Cher, I, I think at the high school level, career technical educations or CTE pathways very much think about how, in addition to the education they're providing to give students some certifications that are industry recognized and Network Plus was mentioned earlier, Security Plus, a lot of these entry level credentials are appropriate at the high school level. Community colleges do an outstanding job of making sure that their graduates uh, have both a degree and associate's degree whether it's for credit or non-credit courses, but combined with an industry recognized certifications. As Mark's kind of confessed, four-year colleges and universities, not so much. <laughs> or if they do offer training and certifications, it's done by professional and continuing education, kind of at a distance, if you will. So again, I'll put in the chat here a recent Lumina Foundation funded effort between the Association of Public and Land Grant University and WorkCred and others to try to really incent and encourage more universities to do this. And this kind of goes to a point I made at the beginning. A lot of employers are not finding college graduates being job ready because they don't have the hands-on skill or experience required because the academic classroom doesn't provide it. But that combined with industry recognized credentials, certifications in this case, uh, could help address that gap. So I think we're seeing some movement there and Mark certainly described how his institution is opening up to that as well. Yeah, and thank you both for that. I also wanna pull on a topic that came up there just briefly. 
recognizing that there are certain populations, certain demographics where there are issues with retention um, and that oftentimes certain populations are underserved or underemployed. Um, and so, uh, Dominique, a question for you on this one, and then I'll open it up to everyone else. Uh, can populations that are frequently underemployed, like people with disabilities, like veterans, help fill some of the, these cybersecurity workforce gaps? How do you target those populations? How do you get them interested and skilled in cybersecurity? Uh, and how do you design programs that are inclusive for all but start to address some of these challenges? Yeah, there's a lot in that question. <laughs> so I'm gonna try to take it. In yeah, small. dive in wherever you want, thanks. Yeah, so we, we, do, um, we do target Kind of underemployed or unemployed um, people who who honestly probably don't they, they maybe they have an interest in computers right they're video gamers or they're people who like you know hang out in online forums or something like that so maybe they have like a little bit of an interest but they don't really have an uh, a history in coding they don't have all or any it background and and there are some challenges with that we do have some issues with retention. Um, and so that piece that Don had talked about earlier in terms of mentorship is really crucial in retaining those people. So you need to make sure that they have someone who they can go to with questions or concerns or just like if they need to vent. And that's one way to really work on retention. There, we do have, because we, we know that we're going to be dealing with um, a large veteran population, and some veterans will disclose disabilities and some will not, um, and, and that's true, I guess, in the general population as well. And so we also have a real uh, concern in our program about how to design our coursework and the on-the-job training component so that someone who has a disability but maybe hasn't told us right, that their needs are being served. So this means making sure that all of our materials are inclusive for as many people as we can. So if we're doing videos, trying to make sure they're all closed captions, making sure there are transcripts available if possible, um, trying to make sure that if someone is, maybe um, they have trouble with their eyesight, that things are downloadable so they can make it bigger fonts. Just, you know, making sure all of that stuff, that inclusive nature of our materials, the materials that we're creating. And that includes not just our course materials, but our website and our marketing materials and all of that stuff, having all of it be inclusive. It's really a challenge because every time you create something, you have to really think about it. Like who is the audience? What are some potential obstacles that they may have when they're reaching this? And so there, that kind of, so retention is one issue. And I think mentorship can help with a lot of that. Um, as Dawn kind of alluded to when she was talking, and then making sure everything is as inclusive as possible. And we've been working with a group called the Wheelhouse Group to try and make sure a lot of our materials are inclusive in that way. Yeah, there's, there's an awful lot of conversation, well, a, a wonderful lot of conversation had about diversity, equity, and inclusion issues, but really pulling apart what that means and all of the thought and consideration that needs to go into that. It's, it's a monumental project. Um, I, I want to stick on this theme of retention uh, for a little bit. Um, Mark, you've, you've briefly touched on how organizations can address poaching and ensure retention outside of, dig, uh, outside of some of these digital hubs, how, how you can kind of keep Western talent out West, uh, or maybe more appropriately said, make sure that there's opportunities for people and ways for people to work wherever it is they want to work. Um, have you found, um, in addition to just sort of creating virtual learning environments, what have you found that sort of enables that and allows that kind of learning and that kind of work? Well, you know, I think it is one of the, the questions of the digital age, right? I mean, we've had, uh, I'm a historian of technology, but, you know, America used to be 80% rural, 20% urban, and then we had rural urban migration to man the factories, right? Um, and I'm mindful, I keep using the word man the ramparts, man the factories, man and woman, right? Okay, but it is, the, <laughs> okay. Um, and now we're having this digital revolution. I mean, this is epic stuff. I, I mean, like, like I said, it's, it's macro. They had the agricultural revolution, industrial revolution, and now this digital AI in mechanical devices, intelligent machines, but then cyberspace, which is, you know, almost unimaginable. The last thing we need to do is to draw yet more vitality out of rural areas, right? And, and just build hyper cities across the coast. And, and we've just seen with COVID, you can work, teach right anywhere. 
right? And and so we've got to find a way. And I and I will I will both compliment, be slightly critical of Alan Poller. Uh, you know, Sands, brilliant visionary, built Sands. He came out to North Dakota. I gave him great credit and. I, people here didn't realize what a rock star, you know, they, he, they gave him a sandwich out of the sandwich machine. Like, why are we not taking him to lunch? I grabbed him, took him, you know, back to the Capitol, but he came out for our K-20 cyber thing. And he said, my goal is to find your best talent and get him to NSA, you know? And I'm like, well, that is true. However, you know, we would like to build companies here that can support people. And, and, and the pandemic showed, I mean, entire cities were shut down. I'm telling you, North Dakota had a few bumps in the road, but it just kept going because the low density populations. And so just like strategic home porting for the Navy, you spread the fleet out, we should spread our workforces out. So they're not all within 50 miles of, of NSA and 50 miles of Silicon Valley, right? You know, um, So it, it's more than just a local selfish thing. We'd like to keep our kids here. It really is a national security thing to spread the capability, the talent out, the companies, um, and then also, I think you will increase the number of people who want to stay in here if they can also be near an elderly parent um, or like the tribal people. I mean, they are so linked to their land, you know, um, that to tell them like, really, you want to be in this career field, you need to move to Washington, D.C. I mean, talk about culture shock, you know. So what can we do? Uh, some of the things we're trying to do is, is, you know, shrink the distance through the Internet, meaning, you can have partnerships that you don't have to actually be in proximity. That's through our Dakota Digital Academy, building community that you're part of something. So we can maybe hire some talent up here. Like, hey, you're not just at this one school by yourself. You're part of a network of professors and instructors. Also on that, we really need to think differently about what, what we want to do on the adjunct faculty and others. Like we've talked about in our Dakota Digital Academy, having the distinguished chair of North Dakota in cybersecurity. I know academics like titles, but... Oh, I'm the distinguished chair at Harvard. I'm the distinguished chair of the state of North Dakota for cybersecurity. And guess what? I'm I'm an adjunct and I work at Microsoft part time. You know what I mean? And and so bring in a lot of that talent that they made their money and now they want to teach. You know, um, and uh, and then we've got to be, have competitive salaries, which we have to do get by scale. Um, but I think it really is a huge issue. And if we doubt the magnitude of this, if you haven't followed this, Senator Schumer just on Tuesday. His endless frontier bill hit the Commerce Committee in Washington, D.C., 180 billion, I think. They're going to rename the head of the National Science Foundation and National Science Technology Foundation. They want to build 10 hubs of innovation. Cyber is featured as well. Semiconductor supply chain. So, so you know, there's a huge influx of money that may come. And we've got to make sure it doesn't accelerate again, this movement out of rural mountain states, you know, into the into the big mega uh, metropolises. So, yeah. I, so the geographic lens is absolutely one way to look at retention issues, but I think that there's, um, separating it from geography and thinking about it in terms of employers, Don, I'm, I'm curious to think about how, how you view, uh, sort of retaining employees at Lockheed Martin. What are the steps that the company has put into place for that? So there, there isn't any one um, solution for that. <laughs> um, and we're, we're dealing with people, not robots. So um, what helps us a lot is having a lot of different communities. Uh, so we talked about res uh, resource groups earlier. So in Lockheed, we have about 46 different um, resource groups. Um, we have, uh, we have, what do we have? The Hispanic Organization for Leadership and Awareness, ABLE and Allies um, for those that are disabled or those that are caregivers. Um, we have military veteran groups. We have pride groups. Um, we have women impact groups. And so I think what helps us with retention is when people feel like they're not just working, um, but they feel like they belong somewhere like they're, they're part of a community that's growing and they're part of that community that is also helping the community grow as well. And they're being heard. Um, when we do, when I do mentoring, a lot of my mentoring sessions isn't really talking about how to um, figure out some technical challenge. Um, that's done on a daily basis through emails and IMs and phone calls. Um, a lot of my discussion is, is really um, just on people wanting to uh, build their confidence, people wanting to learn how to um, uh, learn from failing, you know, what can I get out of failing, um, uh, people just uh, you, learning about wanting to hear my lessons learned, 
um, through my experiences and, and uh, uh, my careers. So um, I think that's what it's, uh, like I said, there's not any one thing, but what has helped us really is that community. Um, and when I talked about top talent, I talked about the fellows program, and that's another community you can look at. Um, and being able to build that trust as well. Um, and when you have that trust and you have that community, um, that a lot of times um, contributes to uh, employee loyalty. And so it's that employee loyalty where you're spending, um, I mean, we have we have families, we have grandparents where their sons, daughters are working for Lockheed and their grandchildren are working for Lockheed. And um, because, you know, they, they've uh, they've heard about all this great stuff that Lockheed offers um, besides uh, just the uh, the type of work opportunities that we offer. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, in this, as in so many other parts of workforce development, the key is thinking of people as being people and being yeah. humans and all of the things they do and need. Uh, you know, it's it's really core to it. Um, right. They need to be heard. That's what yeah. it is. They need to be heard. Yep, absolutely. Um, you know, it's it's interesting in in my work for the Solarium Commission right now. We're really looking at the sort of systems that pull this all together. And, and Rodney, I'm going to kick this one over to you because you're the expert on this one. Um, but in looking at the sort of larger workforce development system, um, there is some value to being able to have talent move in between different employers to reducing some of the friction for that movement through the workplace, which I know is not employer's favorite thing to have people move on. But from an overall perspective, being able to have employees gain different perspectives, gain different experience and have the option to move around the the, the um larger community, the larger ecosystem does have value. Uh, Rodney, if I can throw this one over to you, how can the cybersecurity community facilitate mobility and exchange uh, sort of between public and private organizations as a strategy to solve some of the workforce development challenges that we see? Yeah, so Laura, I think the typical human capital process talks about recruiting, hiring, developing, and retaining. And don't get me wrong, I think retention is especially important from a workplace culture perspective that people feel that they can work in an inclusive environment, the mission's important and all the rest. Uh, but I think there's two things working against us, not only in cybersecurity, but just in the modern time. One is we're talking about a very competitive workspace right now. And so people are gonna be leaving from one employer to the next, either because of better pay, um, personal reasons such as Mark mentioned, maybe caring for a family member, maybe they want to see the sunrise over the Colorado Rocky Mountains that they can't see from the East Coast. I mean, there's a variety of reasons people are going to leave. But let me add a second factor, which is not the fault of the job seeker. It's the employment environment isn't the same that it was a decade or a generation ago. You know, lifetime pensions are not being offered by employers. Benefits are shrinking. Um, the ways that employers are committing to the longevity of their employees has fundamentally changed. So we're kind of a, the mindset that mobility is the new normal. And not only because millennials are known to change jobs more frequently, but because the ecosystem is changing around us. So a couple of ways that we address that is, first of all, thinking about how you can still facilitate mobility within an organization. The federal government is a large employer. Um, NIST is an agency within the federal government. But what if an employee at NIST worked here five years and then went to DHS or CISA for five years or then to the Department of Education for five years in what we're calling rotational programs? They're still employed by the federal government. They're still part of that broad employer ecosystem, but they're gaining different experiences, developing new skills, and quite frankly, bringing to that environment some background and experience that we wouldn't gain if we had that same employee in the same environment for a long time. So I think rotational programs are one opportunity, and you're both seeing it through policy as well as legislation being encouraged in the federal ecosystem, and I'm a huge fan of it. Secondly is um, exchange programs. And this is the notion that you not only have to stay within, in our case, the same employer or sector, but you can move between sectors and maybe do it frequently as a way of bringing that same kind of diverse experience to the table. I'll give you a couple examples. One is we have something called the Cybersecurity Talent Initiative that MasterCard, Microsoft, and Workday have funded to help pay the student loan debt of recent graduates up to $75,000 to come and work for the federal government for two years. And after 
after that two years in the federal government, then they go work for one of those sponsoring entities. And quite frankly, we're seeing this as a win-win situation and maybe a third win should be thrown in there because the student is getting a big win by having some of their student loan debt forgiven. Uh, the federal government is benefiting from that new talent that's coming in and of course industry is benefiting as well. And again, we're seeing policy and legislation, for example, the National Defense Authorization Act authorized NIST to do that kind of an exchange program between our agency with the private sector. So. Having said all of that, I think again back to the standardization point and the nice framework, if we're speaking a common language, imagine how much easier it is for that employee or that learner to move about the ecosystem when job titles, job descriptions, development programs start to sound similar in the same way for employers if we're speaking that common language so that a job you know, at Lockheed Martin sounds similar to a job at NIST or the Department of Education or the University of Wisconsin. It's that kind of interoperability that I think we're hoping to facilitate because I think mobility is here to stay. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, sort of speaking to that question of mobility, and I think to a certain extent, this also touches on the um, manning or maybe staffing the ramparts that, that Mark was talking to earlier. You know, they're part of the advantage of that mobility is that there is an urgent need to fill jobs. Um, and to meet that demand for cybersecurity professionals quickly, it seems that programs are really needed not just for students to go into cybersecurity careers, but to upskill or reskill adults now who are working in complementary careers or looking for new careers. Uh, cybersecurity is often touted as a good opportunity for upskilling and earn while you learn training and education programs. Um, Don, I'm wondering in your in your experience at Lockheed, do you do you see many people who are coming in sort of either lateral moving laterally from different careers where they just need a little bit of upskilling to get to exactly the, the, the work world that you have laid out for them? Or are you seeing much of that sort of um, uh, short-term training to get people who are very close to being the right skill set into the jobs that you need to fill urgently? Both. We're seeing both. Um, so uh, because, uh, I mean, cyber is considered a critical field and um, we just can't... Uh, you can't fill all the numbers, which uh, we're also looking at, you know, security is everyone's responsibility. So if you're a software engineer, you should be ensuring that you're building secure code. So um, so not just the cyber engineers are working on the security piece of uh, whatever they're developing, whatever technical solution they're developing, but um, we do have programs for both. Uh, and um, so even people that are in a completely different, some people aren't even in a STEM field, um, but they're interested in cyber. Uh, we have programs where they can join the, into the program um, and start learning about cyber over that short period of time. And then we have over a period of time, not short, short, but, and then we have say um, people that are in a STEM field um, so we also have opportunities for them to cross, say, from software engineering or systems architecture into the cyber piece of it. And then we have people that are within cyber. Um, so we have our cyber system security engineers and, uh, you know, say they want to develop into a cyber architect. So we have opportunities for that as well. That's fantastic. Thank you. And I apologize on my end in that universal pandemic experience, someone just fired up a lawnmower right outside my window. So I apologize <laughs> for the noise. Um, but you know, one of the one of the last big questions, because I know we're starting to come up on time that I have for you all is um, clearly there's an enormous amount of good work being done, uh, an enormous amount of innovation and progress. But what do you think still needs to be done? What's still out there to ensure that we have a workforce that is equipped to meet those cybersecurity threats? Uh, what policies or programs, what, what pieces of this system are we missing that we haven't brought in yet? Well, I'll just throw something out. Um, I found this when I taught uh, an intro course at Annapolis uh, on cybersecurity that there were students that had no idea they had an aptitude for it. Um, they didn't even really understand the challenge. Um, and once they got into it, they're like, I really feel this is my calling. I, I mean, literally, you know, from a, a kid who, who put Legos together, building something, I'm building something, but also this, and, and probably it's the Annapolis ecosystem, but I want to protect people. I want to protect my grandmother, my grandfather, the people who are vulnerable, you know. Um, so it really could be a, a calling, a, a creative thing, 
like I said, it's foundational, everything else. If it's not secure, you're not going to invent stuff, right? You're, you're not going to be able to protect your privacy. But more people have to know about it, you know? And so something I've tried to push here, and I've met with our gen ed people, and I'm still working on it because we all know how academic change happens. It has to all be bought in on it. But the idea that much like universal literacy training that our country adopted, you know, 150 years ago, right? I mean, if you're if you're a Norwegian immigrant coming here and, and they didn't have universal education, how could you engage in a modern economy if you couldn't speak the language, right? You know, and so if our world is digitizing, which we now know it really is, this is just a massive phase change, pick your metaphor, then something like basic computational literacy with the cybersecurity thing probably should become a, a, a requirement like our state's trying to do across K-12 and then in college, it's a gen ed that you have to have. And then from that pool, you'll start getting, I think, more talent wanting to go into this. Um, so that'd be my one thought, is it really is digital literacy plus security literacy becomes a national uh, initiative. And maybe Rodney's already started that. I don't know. If so, my compliments, Rodney. I, I, think from my I think from my perspective, too, just to add on to that a little bit, until we do that, right, like that's that has to start now, but like it's not done. And until we do that, I think we have to demystify it for um, those populations that are currently underserved. So those underemployed and unemployed people, right? This is uh, when we post jobs at the Cybersecurity Center, a lot of times we don't get a lot of um, we don't get a lot of applicants. And, I, and a lot of times we just think, people think, well, I'm not qualified for that because I don't know a lot about cybersecurity. It seems really scary. It seems intimidating. And I think we need to do, do our parts to try and demystify some of that. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree with you both more. And I would say, you know, one of, one of the great challenges, if I can take moderator's prerogative on this one, one of the great challenges is that there's no particularly obvious nexus where that would come from, right? There is no one actor in this ecosystem whose job it is to provide that digital literacy. It's one of those things where it takes state educators and it takes the federal government and it takes, you know, individual parents and it takes communities and community centers and, you know, all of these different actors need to be sort of thinking about how to how to pull in these issues of civics education, of digital literacy, of general awareness, of security. It's it's a it's a real challenge. Yeah, you know, just to build on a little bit, I mean, think about how culture and um, work ethic, I mean, there's many business people, uh, military have been a long way, that that culture and understanding are are the from the biggest reasons for some country's success and other ones, you know, less success, we'll put it that way, right? Um, and if, if we are digitizing the way we think, this becomes a foundational element of a vibrant human culture intersecting with the digital age, right? Whereas you can imagine an economy where the people don't know it, they are uh, careless with their data, careless with security, careless with their children's privacy, you can see them being crime ridden, right? You know, uh, and weakened and loss of wealth and intellectual property. Um, the analogy would be, you know, what if you have a country that didn't have state militias? We don't want to fund the police. We don't want to have public hygiene, right? You know, I mean, that was a little bit of a debate with COVID, right? Look how well Germany did. My gosh, their public health, bam, you know, they got this COVID thing under control. Some countries you know, Brazil is still reeling, right? And so if you take that to the digital age, there really is a calling at a higher level that, uh, you know, cyber hygiene, cyber knowledge could become the bedrock of, of more resilient communities, preserve privacy, uh, successful protection of intellectual property, you know, across the board. So so I know the Solarium Commission is doing a lot, but there's some more for you, Laura, to add to the Solarium Commission. So. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, Don, did you want to add on to that one? I did. Um, I think people need to understand the why do I care? Um, why is this important? And um, what is the risk? Uh, you can find a lot on what's going on open source. You don't need a security clearance to find out what the threat is, advanced persistent threat, their tactics, techniques, and procedures. Um, also, um, taking it a step further from risk. So the um, you don't have an unlimited amount of time and you don't have an unlimited amount of money 
to really create things. So there's always that time constraints and the funding constraints. And um, what we've been seeing is trying to get people to understand how to do cost benefit analysis of courses of action and figuring out what the courses of action, what the best COA would be for not only the integration, but the effectiveness of the control over time. Um, so um, I would love to see those two things um, start uh, really uh, growing um, within not just the academic area, but the government industry, um, really teaching uh, students and uh, employees um, those two things. Why do I care? What's the threat? How do I mitigate it? And really you have these constraints. So how do you produce a product within those constraints? Yeah, absolutely. Questions that apply to any field, but this one particularly. Any well, other I, thoughts? Yeah, if I could just quickly chime in with two summary thoughts. One that we've talked about, but I, I wanna emphasize is that the inclusion of the underrepresented groups is so critically important for the long-term success. If we talk about a workforce shortage, if we could just make our workforce in cybersecurity more diverse and inclusive, the problem would be solved. You know, start with that premise. And so I know there's a lot of good efforts. There's a lot of emerging efforts. You know, NSA has a new cybersecurity education diversity initiative working with HBCU and institutions to try to help them develop capacity by having their centers of academic excellence be mentors. Uh, this year's appropriation bill gave DHS authority to create an intelligence and cybersecurity fellowship program working with minority serving institutions across the board. Um, Dawn, I think I heard you introduced as being involved in the Women in Cybersecurity organization. And Laura, I know you've done research for NIST and NICE on women in cybersecurity. So, you know, it's not that there isn't a lot of effort there, but it does kind of come back to that retention issue we talked about earlier. It's not enough to develop them and interest them, but once they get into the workforce, we have to retain them. And that's not just about them taking other jobs. It's about the environment needs to be inclusive and we need to really be committed to that equity piece. So I really want to emphasize that. And then the final thing, which is kind of related, is, you know, we're a national program, we work with international partners as well. Um, but we also think what you're doing in the Western Governors Association on a state by state basis, or a community by community basis is where it starts, because you need to get your local K through 12 system working with the community college system working with the universities, working with the employers, a, a general statistic is that students go to college within 50 miles of where they grow up, and they take their first job within 30 miles of where they go to college. So even though I'm thinking national, you need to think local and regional. And that's why we're really committed to getting local alliances and partnerships working together to make sure you're meeting local needs. And sometimes those local needs, as Mark said, might be helping your employees or your, your students, your, your citizens work for me across the country. I can't emphasize enough how much we need to capitalize on the lessons learned of the pandemic. I have three employees working for me currently that lived in Western Governors Association states. It's possible, it's doable. And I think, you know, this notion of bringing in rural America or uh, remote work has got to be part of that future solution as well. Yes. And what a great note in there. I, I couldn't agree with you more, especially on those issues of diversity and inclusion connecting with people where they are. Um, Lauren, I, I think that we're just about out of time, unless there are any other burning comments that anybody wants to sneak in before we hit the top of the hour. All right, well, thank you so much. It's been illuminating and very engaging. Thank you to all of our panelists and thank you to w WGA for hosting us. Yeah. You did an thanks. awesome job moderating. Thank you. That thank was you to really Laura good. and thank you to everyone. We really, really appreciate you having um, having you on to share your expertise on such an important issue um, and such a relevant issue, especially as we move even more and more into a digital and uh, remote age. Um, so again, uh, the webinar will be posted online. We've been recording it today, so you can access it within the next couple of days on the westgov.org website. And then we'll also be sure to post the links that Rodney put in the chat so that everyone can access those as well. Um, so thanks again for your time and looking forward to engaging on uh, future cyber, cyber issues in the future. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks, Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.